Yes, okay. Uh, I'm uh, opening the, 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 the uh, forum for, for uh, questions. Please feel free to, to put questions, to make comments. Yes, of course, please but just, just wait for a mic. Um, hi, I'm Wouter, I'm a historian. Um, I have an extremely subjective, uh, it's not even a question, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an uh, expression, um, a, a very subjective expression uh, of something that I was going through for the last two, uh, two or three uh, lectures, uh, oh, sorry, and, and uh, it's so subjective that I can only express it with a country and western lyric. I'm sure you all know the great theorist uh, uh, from the former West, uh, Patsy Cline. She had a song called Stop the World and Let Me Off. I'm tired of going round and round. And uh, I, I, I thought of that, that lyric because I, I've, there's something to me, again subjectively to me, which is extremely oppressive about this insistence, permanent insistence on history, as things happening one after the other, and we cannot proclaim the end of history because that would be falsifying it. We are not allowed to step off this train. We have to constantly theorize it. We have to constantly know it. We have to constantly be aware of it, that we are moving in a direction and driven by protest or driven by conflict or driven by something but we are we are not allowed to get off this train and I somehow I but there's another lyric not by a country and Western singer but by an Irish uh, writer James Joyce and he said uh, history is a nightmare that I am trying to wake up from and I isn't there you know isn't there an alternative is is it really so that we are doing ourselves and our community a disservice if once in a w if we would not look at the world that we live in as history is it really the only uh, uh, spec a specter through which we can look at our world thank you for this question i think it is it is actually very good because um I wouldn't say that, that the speakers today have a, 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 a common, uh, have expressed a, a, a common idea about the end of, of history. What they have done is uh, more to problematize, pr problematize precisely this idea. I just, just remind you that, that at the beginning, Peter Osborne uh, told us that these two events uh, uh, 89, the collapse of communism, and 9-11, I, I, I quote, have moved the narrative forward. So this would probably mean that the history is uh, uh, going uh, on, even uh, in, in terms of, of pushing the world forward. Uh, so this is an open question, and uh, please make, feel free to make comments to, to, to <clears throat> uh, probably to answer this, this question. Um, it is at least an open problem, isn't it? Yes, P Peter. Um, to, <laughs> to continue your metaphor, <laughs> there are obviously many pairs of spectacles. It partly depends what you want to see. Uh, in regard to your description of the world you want to get off, you call history one thing after another. But of course, one thing after another is simply one thing after another is precisely what history isn't. Okay? On a certain theoretical concept of history. One thing after another is really something like the everyday in terms of theorizations of modernity. It's actually, you know, what happens while you're waiting for history. Um, so, 
maybe you want to get off the everyday. I don't know. Maybe you're looking for history, but you think you're trying to escape it. That would be my first remark. Um, my, my second remark would be that um, the reason you might want to wear this particular pair of spectacles is because history does things to us. Uh, and we try to understand what's happening to us, I guess. We don't always want to understand what's happening to us. We can have days off. Uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, if we want to act politically, we need to understand what's happening to us. So then we try. Thank you. Uh, Simon or Professor Keda, yes, please. Well, I mean, I just want to say that if you want to act politically, um, of course, it would be possible to emancipate yourself from the narrative of history and say that something is finished and it's all open. And in fact, we have to look for things um, that really have to be totally new rather than something that is simply tweaking an institution that used to be there or, 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 or agitating for the um, return of something that we have lost. But uh, if you are going to be political, um, whom you address, um, people live in the past, and the past is never past. And uh, so it's, it's a question of coming to terms with not only your potential for emancipation, but also the emancipation of the addressee, the public. And, and that requires, of course, a conception of history that is uh, essential if you want to, in fact, convince people that there is something new that is outside of the uh, narrow limits of the narrative. Simon? Did, did you? Can I just say something about the end of history? Yes, of course. Can I just Please. get it off my chest? Um, <laughs> I think I disagree with you about what, what the end of history, what's at stake in the end of history. It doesn't follow because Fukuyama thought that uh, the end of historical communism was the end of history, that the history was in, the, was in historical communism but isn't in, in <laughs> capitalism. I mean, that, that's just a false inference. Fukuyama is just an old Hegelian who thinks that history, history is driven by antagonism and contradiction and that there was an end of co to fundamental contradiction. Uh, that's, that's why Huntingdon's uh, Clash of Civilization thesis is the consistent extension of uh, Fukuyama's discourse within American foreign policy, because it's the reply to Fukuyama within the terms of his Hegelian concept of history, which is, no, we can find a new anti, we can find a new enemy, it's okay, right? Uh, we can find a new enemy. So, uh, the history is not connected to communism. I mean, in a way, it's the other way around, since the concept of communism is modeled on Hegel's concept of end of history, because communism would be the end of history, because it would be the end of the prehistory of freedom. So actually, uh, you know, Fukuyama's concept of the end of history is actually not so different from Marx's. What's different is the way he interprets the world. <coughs> no, no, sure, I was, I was trying to be polemical, so I, I, it, it, it's, it's, it's clear that both these projects of modernization had, had, had an idea of end of history, I think, and that, that's where this idea of two modernities, I think, is, is, is quite useful. Uh, just to remind you, it's not only about the end of history. Um, art has also uh, this idea of the end, within the art theory, uh, uh, theory of art, the idea of the end of art. It's a danto art after the end of art, which means simply not that art doesn't exist anymore, but that certain narrative of uh, pushing forward a, a, a history of art, that this, this uh, has come to an end. That, of course, artists pro uh, are producing art uh, as, as, as before, but they don't have this feeling that by their art, they must push forward some sort of narrative. This is uh, also a, a possible uh, uh, meaning that it's not only about history, it's about art uh, uh, as well. Uh, please, the question, just uh, wait for a mic. 
No, I'd like to go on from what you were saying, because we've obviously had horizontality brilliantly and horizons brilliantly theorized. But I'd like to put the concept of horizon and horizontality together with that of entropy. Because obviously, as you say, horizontality can be brilliantly related to Deleuze and relational aesthetics and even the concept of the installation. But there's also an idea of sprawling and getting out of control and repetition in all this. And I think it's very interesting that the, in some ways people have been both avoiding um, any very challenging artworks in what they've shown and one is getting heartily fed up of a proliferation of endless installations in art that may or may not be grappling with political issues but I would argue are in themselves a kind of symptom of a kind of entropic horizontal situation in which nothing much is happening and, and you know, art, is, uh, art doesn't know where to go on this horizontal plane. Uh, you know, as in, as in the idea of ennui and boredom relating to entropy as well as horizontality. I think there's a problem with contemporary art at the moment that, uh, that all this horizontality is also some kind of symptom of. Uh, yes, Marion, please. I'm sorry, I would like to go back to the end of history. <laughs> um, yes. uh, sorry for, for interrupting you. It, it would be great if you can introduce uh, yourself oh. each before. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, I forgot it. I'm Marin. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I have, I have uh, not a question, I maybe it's much more a remark, because in the last uh, Congress, I remember that there was also a relation uh, done or I think in several of the um, uh, lectures or inputs, uh, they were quoting Deepa Chakrabarti. You know, and Deepa Chakrabarti in, in the subaltern studies have really, I mean, the whole idea on post-colonial studies and subaltern <coughs> studies is grounded on this kind of reflection and analysis of history and the problem that we have with this. Why can't we adapt this kind of uh, theoretical school to us? You know, that would mean that we have also to look for other political subjects or even ask, I mean, where the real struggles go on. Uh, instead of, I mean, looking for uh, teloses or whatever, um, I mean, larger pictures, you know. Why isn't that possible? And of course, this is what the Subaltern Studies Group did, and they were kind of founding even a complete new discipline <laughs> with it, looking at the, the margins and trying to see the uh, society and kind of a concept of society from there. Thank you, Maria. Um, is there any direct comment? As, uh, using this, this um, really, the idea of uh, Indian subaltern studies as a possible model for uh, reviving the history, please. I'd like to translate this question into a question about the Turkey, about your position on Turkey, if I would, B because it seems to me that the, you know, the, pro the provincializing Europe uh, subaltern studies problematic is part of quite a, quite a traditional post-colonial nationalism. And the subaltern studies is not a problematic that gets out of uh, the, the traditional position of, na of nationalism. It's a uh, it's a problematic which uh, you know critiques it from within, in, in relation to particular regional situations. Um, but it does raise the question for me, of the question of the kind of the nationalist dimension that was already <coughs> raised, I think, in one of the questions, in, in relation to your talk. So, uh, in relation to that question, I'd, I'd like you to say a bit more about uh, the nationalist dimension of what you present as this slightly euphoric sense of independence that Turkey's acquired, which I'm slightly dubious about because you're still in NATO. And when you ask the Americans to take their missiles away and see what the response is, will you feel so independent? Um, well, the, the, the euphoria, um, as you call it, <laughs> Is, is, is not really about uh, political alignments 
or, or, or NATO or, or even the European Union. It's, it's, it's more about uh, the ideational sphere, the, the, the kind of um, uh, resurgence of uh, independent thought and independent politics that's now possible. Um, it, the, 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 what I see um, projects as doing, uh, whether it is modernization in the American style or uh, membership in the European Union or nationalism for that matter, is that they um, very narrowly constrain the kind of thinking one has to do because you are either reacting or you are talking within the same vocabulary. Um, Rejecting a paradigm, I think you're right about the post-colonial uh, literature, rejecting a paradigm is not always liberating. It's, uh, it can also imprison you in, in a very tight critique. Um, what I'm talking about, I suppose, is not uh, the nationalism or the uh, flourishing of thinking within Turkey alone. I'm talking about the fact that in the whole world it is everything goes. I mean, there's, there's nothing that, that, that really uh, provides a gravitation towards one type of paradigm or one type of narrative. I mean, look at liberal democracy. It has bankrupt, it's bankrupted itself. There's nothing that you can look at to, to say in the actually existing liberal democracies that, that will attract you. I mean, look at Berlusconi, look at Sarkozy, look at what your... Uh, Cameron is doing, um, throwing people out of the cities, etc. Or look at the, the way in which uh, democracy has become almost totally for sale in the US. Um, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that, in fact, we are at the end of a particular type of uh, thinking about social structures, about the world, about horizons, about futures. And, and that is liberating. Uh, I was simply talking about the reflection of that zeitgeist in this country, not necessarily something that, uh, that, that emanates from its essence or its nationalism or its uh, particular potential. Uh, the fact that it was so tightly embraced by those narratives before and now those have disappeared is the liberation, the, the liberation I was talking about. Uh, just, just, just a moment. Thank you. Uh, would you all, please? Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tone Olaf Nielsen. I would like to pick up on what uh, Marian introduced, uh, namely the um, the actuality of, of post-colonial studies. Um, I think one interesting model to bring into the situation, and maybe this was discussed during the first Congress, which I unfortunately couldn't uh, attend, but is, is the model suggested by transnational feminism and this whole idea of uh, linking up the real multiple struggles um, performed by women, uh, sort of reading up the power of privilege uh, from the bottom up and uh, connecting in a moment of co-responsibility mutual accountability and deep solidarity. Um, so I guess if, I if uh, I'm trying to grasp the notion of horizontality, um, who would be able to, to access this uh, blurry mist of horizontality? Uh, are, are we able to detect multiple struggles and link them together? Thank you. Uh, is it any direct comment? Oh. No, maybe I just, it, 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 this is why, for me, it, it's the, the political potential of, of, of declaring oneself as former West means also then uh, uh, to have, a, 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 if you will, a post-colonial reading of one's own uh, thought processes and one's own placement in the world. So, so this is this is in a way what it means because that's the only way that you can create these kind of solidarity movements, I think. Because the problem is with the restoration project that you see everywhere in Europe, both from left wing and right wing political parties, is that there is there is an idea of where solidarity is located, and it's located in nation states, maybe in the EU, but it's not it's 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 not located in in, in something that can uh, exchange for the for the for the metaphor class. 
which which maybe is where, where of course one can what one can learn from an international feminist movement is that there is this exchangeability there, but that that, that would then mean that one has to think of one's own position of uh, a certain historical privilege because I'm not even sure that it's an actual privilege even if we're talking about a research invest I don't know if it's a privilege to have let's say all the rights uh, of a welfare state taken away from you but uh, still paying a lot of taxes that will only go to a military industry. So this is the situation that, that, that we find ourselves in this form of way. So only if we, rec if we, if we strive to, 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 to deconstruct, I'm not really saying it very coherently, I'm a little bit tired, I'm sorry, but only if we then reconstruct our, our own histor historical subject positions can we partake in such solidarity movements, I think. Okay, thank you, please. <clears throat> Um, I'm again going back. Um, Just e short. Can you please introduce yourself? Very. Ah, okay. Um, I am Fulia Erdemci. Um, I'm a curator and I am the director of uh, SCORE Foundation um, in Amsterdam, Foundation for Art and Public Domain. And uh, I uh, really want to go back to the previous topic about related to Turkey. Uh, it was an amazing uh, uh, presentation for me, mapping out, unfolding the uh, story of modernization and also uh, how we liberate from uh, the uh, one direction, the Western one model of modernization. And uh, it was really interesting for me to listen to the lecture of Charles Arcader. And uh, he uh, put a picture that this uh, um, emancipation from the West uh, brings out a space for us to be, to be, whatever. And uh, uh, he also mentioned about this Orient Express from Istanbul to China. Uh, but I just want to ask another question uh, related to this. Uh, yes, we are right now uh, also, uh, uh, we are governed by such a, a, a a political party that we are looking at the east east i just wanted to ask what which east because which east because we are are we looking at iran are we looking at china are we looking at abu dhabi and dubai are we looking at the capital what are we looking at i just wanted to ask this thank you thank you it's a, would you like probably to respond directly <laughs> okay. it's very concrete it, it, it is a very concrete question. Uh, I, I mean, there are many, many perspectives, obviously. Um, it's, I, I hope uh, there is sufficient uh, 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 public um, participation in the decision-making process, or there's sufficient uh, sort of dialectic of all the views that uh, we don't simply uh, follow whatever the... Uh, Prime Minister or the Congress or the political parties dictate to us. Um, I think, once again, I mean, I want to I want to say perhaps I did not express myself clearly in the lecture, but I want to say that this is a situation not only uh, that Turkey is enjoying or suffering from; it is in fact a universal situation that there are no projects to follow at the point at, at this time. And um, it, it is, you know, we have emancipated ourselves perhaps from the, uh, the narrow Western orientation, but in a way so has the West. Um, they have emancipated themselves because there is really, as I was saying just a minute ago, that the, the, the kind of politics and the kind of uh, social imaginary they have at the moment has obviously bankrupted itself and it is um, in, in a quagmire. So, in, in a sense, everybody is struggling and everybody is trying to... So, I'm not sure that, you know, simply because the West is to be rejected, it means necessarily that we turn to Iran or to Dubai. Or, I mean, there's a lot of potential out there and, and a whole new world seems to be in the process of construction. That's what I want to underline. Thank you. Um, uh, first, you, you please. I have a question for Julie Old. Um, Can you please introduce yourself? Yes, shortly? my name is Shuddhabrata Sengupta. I'm from the Rux Media Collective. Um, I was very uh, fascinated by your uh, delineation of the horizons of the practice of the group material. 
And um, my question has to do with, with, with reflecting on how one bases uh, one's own practice in reference to the horizon of its own history. Um, because I think you, you proposed, uh, and it's, it's partly to do with also a discussion of the horizon of tradition, and here is the horizon of tradition of a, of a constellation of work that, con that, that constitutes a moving identity, which is the history of the group material. Having come through it, in a sense, having crossed over the other side, onto the other side of the horizon, then looking backwards as does, does the history of your own body of work, which is a collective body, does it constitute a reservoir of some sort, or does it constitute a set of cardinal points and limits uh, for thinking then about the future of your work as an artist? Yeah, thank you. Um, several things come to mind. In, in a certain sense, I, I don't think of it as, I don't think of it as a history. I mean, my relationship to group material is not is not about history so much as how the principles of the group and the um, and the practice of the group is something that was formative for me and informs my work now and so there's a there's a continuum there but and I don't normally think of it as history but I I do have to say that I I think there's a there's a real pressure when one starts to see their work in history or to think about it that way and think oh my goodness I have a history you know my practice has a history and that can be the opposite of um, liberating I guess and and can feel um, like I mean I've, I think group material went through an experience of feeling very constrained by an external notion of it ha group material having a history right that said there's always there's also a moment or let's say a, a timing to dealing with your own history, you know, and um, but not so much for personal motives, but in the case of group material, I think I and others in the group have been concerned that about the sense of possible disappearance, right? When a practice is ephemeral and was time-based and um, contextual and not wanting to you know, have it objectified and not wanting to have the key, I suppose, dimensions of the practice amputated by just giving it over to the formats of art history or something, or cultural history, but wanting to take that on ourselves. And that seemed like a really viable and important project to take on. Um, I don't know. So it's, I mean, I think, you know, some days you wear that hat that you're thinking of in terms of history, and then it's really, someone else said that earlier, it's very important to then to take that off, or to take a, I mean, take the time off from that and use a different lens for, um, for understanding your own practice, you know. Does that answer a little bit, yeah? Uh, okay, uh, just a moment, you were, uh, Hello, this is Tati Freke, also from SCORE in Amsterdam. I was also moved by the presentation of Mr. Kader and um, wondered if in the process of this research for Former West, we've also touched on the subject of migration vis-a-vis -vis the concepts of Former West and Former East. For is it not that the perception of what we call West in the European West is very much influenced by first and second generation of migrations from the East? And for instance, of late in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands, we see a surge of actually middle to, um, middle to higher uh, class or social echelons of uh, Indian and uh, Chinese and Japanese um, migrants that are knowledgeable and very well educated and them settling in what we call European West, would that not influence how we in future would look at the former East or future East? Would you probably uh, comment? 
you don't have to. No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. It's, it's, I think it's an interesting question with the migration. Yes. That, that we name it, you know, explicitly. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that is true. What uh, you're, you're saying that that. Uh, however, um, let me talk about the um, Turkish migrants. Turkish uh, migrants in Germany. Um, it seems uh, that at the moment um, there are more people coming back to Turkey um, than going into Germany from Turkey. And the interesting thing is um, um, the uh, people coming back are the most educated uh, uh, stratum of the um, Turks in Germany. Um, some of them are citizens. Uh, most of them seem to be university graduates uh, and they find that um, uh, that uh, that life is uh, more interesting here, uh, perhaps. Um, what what I suppose that suggests is that uh, the, the 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 kind of flow that we are used to and 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 what you would expect as the flow um, uh, installs itself in Europe is not necessarily uh, is, it will not necessarily follow the pattern of the earlier period. It might be much more back and forth and uh, would have perhaps the same the impact that you are talking about, this, this back and forth. Uh. Thank you. Please. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm Angela Harutunyan, uh, art historian, and I'd like to go back to, to this uh, question of horizons and the end of history. Uh, and it seems quite ironic for me that uh, <laughs> Uh, that, that we are referring to uh, the Soviet experience as historical communism because uh, the, the very fabric of the, the communist ideology, at least in the Soviet Union, was also the end of history before Fukuyama. That basically um, uh, communism ar ar arrives when um, there are no classes, the class struggle is, is, ab is abolished. Um, and, and actually I, I would also like to add um, um, of course, the, the agendas are different in Fukuyama's end of history and in the communist end of history. But I'd also like to um, add a collection to Simon Sheikh's collection of horizons, and uh, it's a Sots art piece, I think uh, dating back to 1978 or 9 by Russian artist Eric Bulatov, in which he um, um, juxtaposes the um, three dimensional illusionistic space of ideology which is a horizon, uh, with the two-dimensional space of propaganda, and it's a two-dimensional um, graphic rendering of CCCP, KPSS, which is the Central Communist Party. Um, and which is also very ironic because, um, in, in a sense, um, I think whereas uh, in the communist um, project, uh, the, the space of the horizon, the ideological space of the horizon was constituted through, through language, in Fukuyama's case, it's uh, constituted through, uh, through money, and it is Boris Groys's argument. And it seems like where uh, Eric Bulatov's uh, KPSS is going is precisely towards that horizon of uh, Fukuyama's uh, end of history. So just a comment. Is there a comment on comment? <laughs> okay, Adam. More questions of comments? Katerina. I have a question. <clears throat> I'm Katerina Degat, uh, critic and curator from Moscow. I completely agree that, of course, uh, Fukuyama's idea was designed uh, not just after the idea of communism, but I would say rather specifically on the Stalinist idea of communism. But on the other hand, it's also influ definitely influenced by the change of paradigm in technology and uh, in the adventure of uh, images in massive uh, quantities, uh, and on the of the imago-centrism, -centri I would say, of the current culture, which makes history and historical thinking and horizontal thinking, in this sense, uh, less and less possible, which might be also the, have been the case with Stalinist term at some point. Um, I would also refer to what uh, Simon was uh, uh, saying about horizontality, and I would remind about the turn which Lisitsky took uh, from um, vertical 
explain, and I'm surprised that we never heard the term vertical actually as an opposition to horizontal. And for Lisitsky, it was an important opposition from the vertical artwork in a vertical plane as a symbol of authority, as opposed, and it was something which he introduced, an artwork in the horizontal, on a horizontal plane. And we, he was thinking about a book, on a, even on a coffee table. He was thinking that this coffee table would be, um, provide a space of criticality, we could say, of discussion, more than an artwork, a painting, which hangs on a, on a vertical uh, plane. Uh, and uh, I would say that this artworks on a horizontal plane, which might be installations, might be kind of research projects, are taking more and more space in contemporary uh, art world. Uh, maybe it's just a comment, maybe it could uh, you know, stimulate uh, some reactions from the uh, participants. Thank you. Yes, please. I mean, I think, I think there's, a, there's a linguistic confusion here in English um, between the horizontal and the horizontal. Um, the role of the horizontal in art, and if you think of, you know, you know you're talking about Lezitsky or more recently, you know, Rosalind Krauss on Jackson Pollock and Warhol's piss paintings or whatever. Um, that, that is a discourse which is not about the horizon. At, at all, it's a completely it's a spatially. It's a completely different discourse. It's about the. Uh, it's well. It's a kind of joke about Greenberg's flatness, right? I mean, it's a kind of movement of the of the surface uh, to a, to a, a a perpendicular plane. But but it's got nothing to do with the horizontal. Um, so I just think we need to be careful about confusing the horizontal and the horizontal because they're, they're not the same. I'm confused though, when, when you say it has nothing to do with the horizontal, I wasn't under the impression that we have an agreed upon definition of horizon here. No, 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 we don't, we don't have an agreed upon definition, but in terms of the spatial imagery of looking down on a horizontal plane, which is what, what's at stake in these discussions, as opposed to actually, in relation to the question of the vertical, the horizon is a product of, verti of a vertical plane. Yeah, so... I mean, it's, it's the line which divides the elevations. <laughs> well, unless that one would say that, uh, that I agree that the, uh, our theory discourse has nothing to do with what we are talking about here as horizon, but the claim here is, or what I would claim is to say that it has, <laughs> that we must view them also through this lens uh, uh, of, of, the horizon, of, of the horizon. To say what what does that what does these images then tell us and what does the rhetoric of let's say Rosalind Krauss tell us politically about these images? You know, no, but I mean, if horizon is a transcendental category, then horizon is always at stake. It's just that its its manifestation is not coterminous with the horizontal. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you want to put a question, Cosmo? No, no. Okay. Uh, please. Oh, there are. Thank you very much. My name is Michelle. I'm a student from the Cotterwood Institute in London. And I, I guess I have a question for Mr. Shea, because uh, you posited the question that can one return to the horizon, a horizon that is already surpassed? So then my question, I guess, is how does this affect the nature of an archive or the physical act of archiving when pa the past seems to become a ghostly space of experience with a horizon that is no longer? And like, would you, how would you relate that to what Sarah was saying just now? Um, the sprawling within an entropy in the end of history. Well, it's actually it would be more a question for Julie to answer because I think this is exactly what you were trying to, 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 to discuss in a way. What, what, what does that mean? If this, it's, it's again, it's, it, there's maybe this confusion. So when I say that, Again, as a, as a polemical question, how is it possible to return to something if we say this is a horizon in a temporal sense that has been surpassed? How would it then be possible to return to it in, in politically? And my point was that that is not possible. It, it's only possible to create to say that the new horizon would be back to the old one, only better because there won't be immigrants. Right? This 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 is a, this is this is the 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 the, the, the return. So it's not really a return. It's a return to an imagined past. So, so it, it wasn't necessarily about archival projects in, in that sense. Uh, there, are, for me, it would always be <coughs> uh, uh, the, the case to look at more in a Benjaminian sense what 
in the past was the proposition of future. That I think would be the interesting thing of going back to the a temporal horizon. But I don't know. I, I, really, I think it, it's kind of something that you really talked about yeah, more at I length. Yeah, but I have to ask you to to f tell me the question again because I'm afraid I didn't quite get it all. Well, I guess uh, for you, I would ask um, how, if you take into consideration what Mr. Sheikh was saying, how does it affect your opinion over your archive and your physical <laughs> act of archiving in this case when? The past is like a, hor um, a horizon that no longer is no longer. Well, I think, I mean, if I stick on this very specific case of group material, because I don't really feel comfortable to abstract from that, um, one of the, one of the um, consequences of looking at, of creating the archive and looking at the archive in, other, in order to reinvestigate group material and then do the historical represent, uh, representation of it was realizing finally that there was no longer, that it was no longer, you cannot revisit that horizon and that the, um, and I think that's a good thing to put to rest in a sense, right, by, by going into the archive and by looking at these processes of, I don't know, um, retrieval and vivif vivification that it seemed in the case of group material that it was at the same time as you open it up and open up group material for future research and, um, and open it up to various points of entry through this representation of say the book in the archive, you also, uh, let's say on a, on, a, on a practitioner level of doing that, I also realized that that horizon is definitely um, past tense, in a sense, right? That group materials work, it kind of represented to me the, or made dramatic, the more dramatic, the contextual and temporal and ephemeral aspect of the work, which, you know, why I said something like context cannot be recreated, so it wasn't something that um, one can resuscitate, really. It's a different vantage point of looking. I have a feeling I'm not making that much sense because I have to say I'm really jet lagged, and and, and 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 not only that, but it's also balancing the different conversations between very large, you know, abstract theoretical conversations, and then and statements like what you said a few minutes ago about there are no projects to follow, and then suddenly into art or over here to art with a very kind of large um, impression. I think someone, your comment, one of the questions was about um, how there's nothing happening in art, you know, which, or this it's the end of art history or something. And, and balancing those, um, I feel like I'm having a kind of balancing problem, which makes me wonder also to the organizers of of this, how, like, what is the relationship? Why is art, per se, so central to this discussion? And how are we navigating that um, balance bar, basically, you know, between these very large issues and then, and how are we connecting the art with the, with the larger political stage at this point, you know? This is a very good question. <laughs> we, we can answer that. We can say that art is the institutionally funded place for the displacement of political discourse. But you... No, but it, maybe it, it, it's, it's good to return to this. That, that, and I would agree, and this is also a, a, a sort of self-criticism, that it's strange to say that one expects of art the unexpected and therefore gives art a very privileged political role in political image making. So this is, this is of course, highly problematic. I would totally agree with yeah. that. Uh, but in, in terms of using these terms, it's always, it's, 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 for me, it's, 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 it's possible, or hopefully it's possible by using these kind of terms, whether we use the term horizon specifically or whether we use the other, even less def defined term, former West, as a prism for which we look at the objects. Right. So to, that, that would give us, I hope, hopefully, I mean, I wasn't trying to do any kind of art history or any kind of canonization with the images I showed, but actually to put them in a specific, uh, 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 current, let's say, 
slash historical political history mm -hmm. or situation to place them there and say that they also speak about that or that these situations <coughs> speak about them. So, so, so this would this this would hopefully be the relationship. So, so it requires, of course, precision. I agree. If we go completely from the abstract and then to a singular work, it, it's 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 complicated and it and it's and it might not be a very productive relationship. The, the, the second thing that I thought about also, though, is that here is maybe where these terms can be used, and that's why I would argue, even though I certainly agree that it's true that that the horizon, if the horizon of expectation is directly connected to space of experience, it must also then be a barrier for the unexpected. I would totally agree with, with Peter on, on that point. That if anything we can expect has to do with what we have experienced, then it stands as a barrier to radical change as much as the facilitator of it. Or that would be the discussion anyway that maybe we can have in the next few days. But if, if these terms are useful in analyzing exhibitions, it's, it's also then a way of saying it's not just the horizon of the projects of group material that cannot be transposed. It's as much the space of experience mm -hmm. that was that particular moment of the AIDS crisis right. uh, yeah. uh, that you can't translate by redoing the exhibition. So, and you certainly can then translate the relationship, if there is one, between that as a space of experience and then what was a horizon of expectation, if mm -hmm. there was one. That, that can't be translated. That would have to be, or that, that would be meaningless to show as an artifact, no? I think, that, and that, therefore it would be, what would then be the adequate form if it was to continue that line? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Charles. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I think it, um, it's maybe Can you introduce worth, yourself? Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, Charles Escher, and I'm director of the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Um, um, I was wanting really to, 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 to remind us maybe, or to remind myself, or think about the, the, the last moment of, uh, of Peter's talk, where he talked about the fact that the, the task was to puncture the horizon of expectation and that that could be done by art or politics, I think you suggested, rather than to reconstruct or in a way succumb to the indeterminacy uh, or the determined, determined uh, indeterminacy which the horizon suggests, in a sense. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit in that spirit that I want to return to one specific question, which I think focuses maybe more on former West than the horizon. So I hope you'll forgive me for taking it off in a slightly different direction. But you said something that really intrigued me, which you, which you said that in 1989, the ideological basis of capitalism became far more visible uh, than it was before, because it was blocked before. And I really, really was intrigued by that, because I think that's slightly counterintuitive, yeah. at least in my understanding. So I wondered whether you could, uh, because I think if it's true, it's, it's very important, because in a sense, the, the puncturing device of the horizon has to be an ordering, and ideology is one sense of ordering, of ordering externally to itself. <laughs> A set, of, a set of random facts. Yeah, history is another one, but ideology is perhaps more, more appropriate in this moment. And so if we could understand the ideology of capitalism in, in a certain way through the trope of 1989, then we could also maybe under, or come closer to understanding what former West might be. I, mean, I, I only have like two, two more thin thoughts about this. I mean, one is that the, um, because on, on my analysis it became more visible, the, if you like, the reactive naturalization of capitalist social relations has become even more extreme. So that the, um, the way, for example, that the financial crisis is being used to try to impose an utter naturalization of uh, capitalistic social relations, and not just an utter naturalization of capitalistic social relations, but an utter naturalization of very specific uh, regimes of financialization that are actually contested internally to capitalism by you know alternate capitals etc but that the need to the need to naturalize the relations in a way is so intense that it overpowers the uh, the possibility of actually having a kind of internal the public intra capitalist debate about the financial crisis the financial crisis is, if you like, presented to us in such a way that there cannot be any debate about it, certainly in England, right? The only hope they have of getting away with this is installing the idea that there can be no debate about it. Because, of course, as soon as there's any debate about it, the whole thing just completely collapses and, you know, on internally economic terms. Um, 
So it, it's odd. But one of the other things that's quite interesting is that uh, capitalism up until 89, and in fact longer for maybe in, into the early years of this century, capitalism was a, was a category of the left. It was a category of Marxist critique of political economy. And sort of the revival of neoliberal, <laughs> neoclassical economics, you know, insisted on talking about markets only. Right? It wouldn't talk about capitalism, it talked about markets. What's interesting now is because the horizon of the uh, former East has gone, capitalists now talk about capitalism. Uh, and it's really quite interesting <laughs> to read, you know, all these you know, Nobel Prize winners, these American economic Nobel Prize winners, they all talk about capitalism, and they think people who just talk about markets, right, are, you know, just haven't got up to speed. Um, so that there's a, it's a very contradictory situation, I think, in terms of the, um, you know, the, present, the historical presentation of these social relations, I think. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mal, please. It's a little bit a bridge back to the young lady from London uh, with the question of his ghostly experience in an archive with no horizon. <laughs> um, because also with the visibility of capitalism, um, the former East Germany experience that we had was that you were stepping into a city where you were, it was full of archives with no horizons anymore. They didn't have to say anything, so they were just left there and decayed. Nobody took care anymore of them. No. Only few which could create this reunification horizon were taken up. You were in kind of a ruins, it was like a war situation. And that was for me formerness, I have to say. That is an experience, I think, that me as a Westerner, I haven't had. My archives in my society are still valued, you know, and there's still something that is worked with. Yeah, I even can do it from a marginal position, but I have never experienced that the knowledge production that I was part of is completely obsolete. Yeah. And I think that's something also what, what struck me the whole time when we are discussing on these questions of, uh, on horizons. I mean, what does it mean for maybe people from that kind of, uh, that experience this kind of histories. You know? Because they try to create, with their disobedience movement, try to create horizons. Yeah? And immediately, when they did so, it was former, in a double sense, a former society and a former horizon. You know? So I think there is something, uh, I suddenly felt a little bit uncomfortable that we didn't answer your question because I think we had this experience 20 years ago. Um, please, would you then, okay. Yes, uh, Sarah Wilson from the Cortal Institute. I was going to say exactly the same thing because I went to East Germany when the whole of the Max Lingner communist archive had been sent from the state back to his childless widow and therefore I was going to say to Julie especially as we're involved in grant applications and things that there's a kind of fantasy about future researchers because unless desire subtends the archive there are no future researchers and so the you know the you, you have to have the the desire to valorize something for the archive not to become rubbish, not to become the dustbin of history. So I think it's a very important idea and this kind of fantasy that I was very interested in your presentation, uh, firstly because it's, it makes a fantastic parallel to that of Sophia Kulik in Eastern Europe who's devoting her whole later life to constructing her own former archive because nobody else will do it for her, with, with the help of other people of course, but it's a very interesting and different parallel. Um, and um, what was I going to say? Um, and and um, this idea, you, yes, I was in your presentation. You talked about um, I can't remember what you said, but you talked about the people walking through you past your graphs as you know people who are in attendance. 
uh, there was you, you you talked about the spectators looking at your timeline as people who attended the exhibition obviously the subject of your presentation i.e. the AIDS crisis and government manipulation was highly emotive but for me it's not a question of your very admirable artwork and the work of your group but paradoxically obviously what you showed could not politically empower those spectators they were in attendance presumably they emoted presumably they were angry I have but to, I have to just say, though, it wasn't about emotion. It was an analytic exhibition. I, I quite agree with you, but I'm saying your, your analytic, your, your brilliant analytic expose kind of stopped at the point of hitting the spectator in some way where, where I would presume retrospectively and sadly there's a question of to what extent you are empowered subsequently to do anything and to what extent those spectators were empowered. There's a very interesting relationship between the archive and potential empowerment and potential disempowerment. That's all I wanted to raise. I mean, I don't... I think that it's uh, quite difficult to judge a work or to judge any work and I don't really feel comfortable with uh, your judgment saying that you don't empower viewers by doing this. I mean. This was an exhibit, and I'm not, I don't want to necessarily say, oh, this was a great exhibition that did this and that, but for me, you know, art, I mean, it's not a question of measuring, did this lead, what did this lead to, but creating points of entry for, for myself as an artist and for, you know, the people that I'm working with and for potential audiences and publics. And, I mean, I just find it, um, it's, it doesn't make sense to me to, I wouldn't be in a position to judge its timeline um, and its effectivity or something. And I also wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to judge another artwork and say this doesn't, this doesn't act. I mean, it seems to me that we, we're kind of putting a lot of, and this is not about AIDS timeline, but that we're putting a lot of pressure on art suddenly to, you know, make, we're making these big claims that it, you know, it can be the puncture, it can, you know, embody the, social imagination, it can do this and that, and these are just um, very large, what's the word, you know, frameworks or goals that personally I can't relate to, you know, in a discussion that way. So, I mean, I think I'm often surprised where, where um, political agency comes from in culture and where it can come, and it can be in an ex, for me it's been possible to have um, something happened in an exhibition that was really transformative or through an artwork, but I can't then put that notion of art should do this or the, you know, the social purpose of art is. That's just not a question, that's not a sentence that I would feel comfortable to finish or, or use. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Mary Song from South Korea. Um, this is very interesting to me because my countries also have North and South. So I wonder if they will talk about former South after they get unified after, um, if that happens. Um, Sorry, I haven't heard uh, which country. Uh, I'm from South Korea. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and in the situation of Korea, it's about, I mean, it's not about us because we just implied all this ideology from uh, Marxism. It's, it's not, none of this ideology is from my country, but we follow and we split our country and now we are living in this situation. And um, when we all talk about former West and um, this is very interesting future for me to see if my country will also talk about this or not later on and maybe this will be um, very like not um, this will be quite irrelevant for you to think about why um, Korea Asia Far East um, it's nothing to do with former West but I think it's really related to this topic because we are divided between communism and capitalism right now 
Um, I wonder any of you have any idea or any comments about the situation where people um, who have different origin and different um, cultures and different um, society implies the different ideas from another country, which is maybe your country or your ancestor, um, comes and then affects right now, and then it might be following the same um, past history as yours. Please, if you have something. Um, well, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting. Your question throws light onto something which is it's hard to know the way it's going to work. I mean, I think it's interesting the way that in the post-war period, the, the uh, Eastern Europe, the Soviet character of Eastern Europe, allowed uh, the European East-West relation to become metonymic for a, a geopolitical East-West relation which was global, so it was a kind of, there was a sense of a condensation of an East-West opposition, uh, you know, symbolically in Europe, but that it was a geopolitical East-West one. So obviously the, the abolition of that particular coding of the you know, regionalism in Europe, that particular political coding of regionalism in Europe does raise the question of what, uh, what happens to the uh, East-West, you know, the broader concept which, which was being in some way interpreted through it. Uh, and it will be interesting to see whether, if you like, it can be turned into a, an intra-capitalistic antagonism uh, or not. I mean, in the, in the Korean situation, presumably you look forward to being former South in relation to, <laughs> to Korea. Uh, but of course, being former South can't help but you know, evoke a geopolitical former southness of an immensely broader kind. So the, there, there are a whole load of interesting things about the kind of, you know, these, uh, these geographical, geopolitical discourses start to fall apart when one element of them is taken out. Uh, and I think that you're pointing to that in a way by, by raising that, that question. Uh, please, uh, uh, just first thing. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, sorry, you're okay. Okay, um, I'll try to ask this briefly. Um, I thought it was actually really what you said about um, what Peter Osborne said about art being the institution about art being the institutionally funded space for political discourse. I think is actually a really sort of significant thing to say. I said for the displacement of political yeah. discourse. <laughs> but um, I mean, I wonder if that if if that and sort of the sort of tenor of the multiple conversations that are happening all at once means that there's kind of a risk of, of sort of bulldozing through the actual work and through the artwork and, and not spending the time to actually listen to what the work has to say because I mean the thing that really struck me about Julie Alt's presentation is the way in which this project, all of the projects but specifically the group material and the poverty line projects actually complicates how former West is being spoken of and how West is being spoken of. So I guess, and I know you're really tired, but if you wanted to um, just sort of address how you see this concept of former West functioning in your own work. <laughs> I know you're really tired, but I want to know how I see what the form, the I think I, uh, I, don't, I don't think I can answer that at this moment. Perhaps I can pitch in um, in the next couple of days and talk about that. That's a big question. But I think the, the, the crucial point was this idea not display but displacement because that's exactly what I think we're seeing, that there is, there is not, a, 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 the way I see it, any, any kind of real coherence about how in the main institutions, art institutions are showing art and then the way that they're creating symposia to constantly talk about political concepts like we're doing today. I just don't see that connection actually. That connection to me is completely sewered and there's business as usual in exhibition practices. 
uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, if you look at if you look at a list of what symposiums has been in, also in really so-called, lack of a better term, mainstream institutions in the last two years, you will find, you know, a lot of the names that have been here that are here, here in this weekend that will be talking there. But it, it doesn't affect the way I, I see it, the curatorial department. But someone but must correct were, me if I'm wrong. Well, you were just <laughs> you were in, in Sao Paulo for some weeks, and you spent a lot. A lot of time at the, presumably at the Biennale, and and also talking with curators, etc. And and that extends to something like the San Paulo Biennale. Your your statement. Uh, <laughs> I mean, because but, that was taking up politics and art as yeah, central. Yeah, but that's that's maybe a, a well another discussion. But but that that, that I think that it, that it it was a very strange mixture of doing it, but then doing it in a way so that it leveled all the works. It, 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 I wouldn't call it bulldozing, but there was, it, there was this proliferation of different strategies, so there was actually no statement made about art being specific in its production of political mm -hmm. images. And then there was, on the other hand, the very abstract interpretation of Rancher saying, but it's maybe a lot of people here haven't seen the Sao Paulo Biennial, saying that, well, all art is political, so therefore we just have to show art to be political. This was, in a way, the argument. And that's, to me, too circular an, an, an argument. Because it doesn't say anything about your politics then. You know, it says something, okay, in an ontological sense, it's, it's maybe political because it's image production, it deals with representation, and so on, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay, please, the question. Well, just coming back to the. the uh, can you please yeah. introduce yeah. Uh, Jesus Carrillo from Madrid, from Real Sofia Museum. Um, just going back to the contradiction or the possible contradiction between the two, the two talks we've just heard one uh, talking about the end of the hegemony and the potential of that 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 uh, that new stage. And on the other hand, uh, Peter's account of very convincing both uh, Peter's account about the naturalization of capitalism as ideology. And that's uh, I mean, they, when you put the two, two the two together, they're completely contradictory. Right? That there's a, an end of hegemony, or there's a naturalization of of capitalism, and uh, and considering that we we keep the word of horizon and, and horizon probably uh, is still a, a valid a notion uh, uh, in in modernity for subject construction and the construction of the political subject. Uh, I mean the uh, the notion of a horizon is is uh, directly attached to the, the 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 subject position and the the the. the uh, and as a, as, a, as a modern formula, and uh, I was wondering whether the um, in this period of naturalization of, of capitalism, uh, as a response to the crisis, that very crisis of capitalism, or that crisis that provoked the naturalization of it as an, as an ideology, could bring up, or probably brought up, uh, uh, a materialization or of a new horizon. What I'm saying is that uh, probably the idealization of capitalism is, con is a counterpart of uh, uh, another movement in which uh, there was the imagination of a horizon that was the horizon of the end of capitalism. Uh, that uh, became very poignant, very powerful uh, a couple of years ago among some activist groups uh, that uh, took these possibility of the crisis of capitalism as a constituent uh, element. So even if um, this horizon was the horizon of crisis, it was a negative horizon, uh, somehow when the, there was apparently no horizon, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, kind of negative horizon sort of uh, turned up, probably was immediately sort of suppressed uh, by, by the other imagination, the imagination that the mere discussion of it, uh, of, the, of, of capitalism as a system, would provoke the ruin and the bankrupt of the whole world. But uh, what I was I'm trying to say is that that uh, negative horizon, or that, that horizon uh, that could provoke the creation of a new political subjectivity, uh, was potentially there. And, uh, and some artists, I would say, uh, probably because uh, 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 politics as an institution, I mean, uh, was trapped somehow within the apparatus, uh, couldn't respond. Some artists somehow 
so that uh, that horizon that horizon as a possible uh, as a possibility of subject construction. Thank you. Is there, it was a sort of comment. Did oh. want to say something? I mean, I think that there, there is a connection because I, th I think I think the concept of hegemony that was a discussion at stake in the con discussion about Turkey is quite a kind of um, you know neo Gramscian discursive one. It's a, in a way about political discourses. There's no your claim was that there's no hegemonic political discourses, not that in some sense there's no hegemony. Um, mm -hmm. But because it, it, it seems to me that, you know, if you're talking about subject production, yeah, um, you know, subjectivation happens at the, at the level of social relations, not at the level of their discursive representation, okay? Um, and it's because subject production happens at the level of social relations that the way that the kind of societies that we live in eliminate political alternatives is essentially by universalizing the sphere of commodification. Because once you, one, then you, if you like, <laughs> you're not producing any subjects who are amenable to alternative political projects. So I think that there's, there's two different levels of political analysis here. And, and because we're talking in an art context, we're talking very much about, if you like, the discursive and ideological articulation of social relations. But the basic political movements that happen at the level of those social relations themselves, which happen at the level of the economy. And then that's why, you know, in my view, this, this if you like, exaggeration of financial crisis into a completely structural solution to a passing balance sheet problem is such an ideological project because it's to, I mean, certainly in Britain, it's to, it's to marketize domains of um, social life and state provision that would have been impossible to do. I mean, like the whole of the university system for a start, for example. Um, so, you know, it seems to me that that's what hegemony is about in a way more than about political discourse. So yeah. I suppose this is like putting this back to you to continue my argument right. with you. Well, <laughs> I mean, there are, there are obviously two different uses of hegemony. Um, one is, of course, the Gramscian one, um, which pertains to what goes on within a particular social formation and uh, it's uh, power balances and um, however the, uh, the uh, ruling um, class groups, elites um, manage to um, hold people in line with promising and uh, in fact um, telling a credible story. The other one has to do with uh, a global uh, sort of concept and, and I think that is much more discursive in the sense that global institutions are only a very rough framework and uh, the global hegemony is uh, powerful in as much as it is able to orient the aspirations and uh, the, the, um, the, the uh, orientation of the elites in various countries. Uh, certainly we can talk about uh, the emergence of, uh, sort of a transnational uh, uh, bourgeois class uh, with globalization uh, but I, I think it would be difficult to say that they uh, enjoy any kind of hegemony at the moment. Um, so what I was referring to is the end of uh, hegemony in the sense that uh, to, to overcome the um, sort of the international relations jungle that people talk about or to overcome the, uh, the various centrifugal tendencies in the global economy, uh, that there should be some uh, narrative that is sufficiently powerful. That seems to be lacking. Um, as a, uh, in terms of how that relates to um, the, the other kind of hegemony, whether or not in fact uh, this naturalization of capitalism as ideology uh, succeeds at each uh, level of, so at, at each different uh, society. I think um, at the moment the contradictions coming out of that deepening commodification are quite clear. Um, I, I, I take uh, Polanyi's uh, sort of uh, uh, story of uh, how the market destroys itself unless it is regulated uh, properly by, by either the community, the state, or the society, or whatever, uh, quite seriously. I think, I, I think the, the kind of inequality, for instance, in the American society, or the kind of um, attack on the, uh, the welfare state that remains in Britain at the moment, 
are unprecedented. And how will these be um, uh, um, digested by the society? And how, how, will, how will it be possible to, to, to sustain them without any, uh, uh, without suffering a real uh, sort of uh, bankruptcy of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the hegemonic uh, sort of story? Or how will deepening commodification of everything um, uh, go on if uh, it really threatens uh, the everyday survival of, uh, of of large majority of the people. I think I think these are real questions. These contradictions that might come out of the naturalization process. Um, on the other hand, uh, the the I think the real question, or what I draw from your question, is well, where is the agency here? Uh, who is going to be actually? Um, <laughs> Uh, voicing this, uh, this, these, uh, these, these uh, malaises, and who is going to be actually uh, coming up with uh, the, the new uh, possibilities and the potentials and whatnot? And 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 there, I think uh, what we have seen in the last ten years is is certainly not very encouraging. I mean, you know, social forums um, they didn't go anywhere. Um, there is not any credible uh, opposition in. In, even in Italy and France, uh, and um, certainly not in Denmark and uh, Holland. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's. Uh, I think I think that's the real uh, uh, sort of uh, mystery that we have to deal with. Very uh, sure. There's also the proposition of uh, Axel Honnef uh, saying that the. Um, paradoxical nature of capitalism is that in one min minute it reveals itself as a moment of liberation, be it a moment of uh, liberatory commodification, and the next minute it will uh, reveal itself as just a more advanced level of, of, of control. Um, what I'm hearing now is this absolute notion of capitalism that there is no outside of it, uh, but there's perhaps movements within capitalism's cracks that allows us to operate within them. And I think there's a tendency within various activist communities, aesthetic and social and political, um, transnational feminism as well, to, to arrive at a moment where we can talk about uh, a politics of the common across differences. Uh, Hardin Negri's notion of commonwealth and so forth. Let me finally uh, misuse my role as moderator to also make a comment because I have been waiting all the time but I, I'm not allowed, you know, so uh, opening for you but I wanted to say something and then now uh, <clears throat> This is, of course, the, this is the question of uh, capitalism as ideology. And uh, the, the question would be, is this what, what Peter says, you know, after the fall of communism, now finally capitalists uh, have been talking about, or are talking about capitalism, finally. Of course, what would be the, the question of uh, a good old ideology critique? Not what they are talking about, but rather what they are not talking about. And this is what they are not talking about, I'm going to say it, this, this word, which has been completely excluded uh, from the discussion, from the whole post-communist discourse. Also in the first uh, Congress, this word is very dangerous, and you know this word, it's fascism. Fascism, uh, well, uh, first I learned of a uh, possibility to think about fascism within the post-communist discourse from a book uh, uh, written by a, a colleague of mine, a Slovenian philosopher, Rastko Mocnik, uh, part of the Slovenian Lacan school, but this is the question of what they are not talking about, but also uh, Althusserian. Um, his book, he wrote it in uh, 95. It's very simple title how much of fascism. So the question is not whether fascism or not, but how much of fascism we can live with. We can, you know, and this was, of course, the question 
uh, of, of uh, he, he was talking about actual existing fascism at that time in former Yugoslavia. It was obvious who who invented the, uh, reinvented the, this this question. Actually, the motto of his book is a, a quotation from um, from a, a, from a newspaper of Bosnian migrants from uh, Bosnia from war who escaped. To Ljubljana, and they, they, they had some sort of a newspaper, you know, collecting names, uh, uh, families. But they, these people, tried to understand what happened to them, and, uh, and this was at that time already the the collapse of Europe as an idea there in, in former Yugoslavia. So they simply recalled, hey, it was Hitler who who had the, this idea of uniting Europe. Of course, by naturalizing social social relations, by naturalizing uh, 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 social conflicts, this uh, so it it is not you know I'm not uh, speculating so much about it. If you would ask me, uh, you know, there, there is a this figure of dissidents, Havel, uh, or, or uh, let's say. Eight of ten dissidents coming from the West back uh, after the fall of communism to former Yugoslavia were fascists. And they were fascists in the same, you know, preserved in the same shape at 45. Why they could? They were deep freezed by the anti communism, uh, uh, anti communism of the West, not former West, of the West. And so deep freeze they, they, they came and there was a mess. Of course there was a mess. But uh, again, this is probably, uh, it's not comfortable to, to talk about it because it is excluded. This is what, what Peter said, you know, this is the outside within. The outside within of the liberal democracy, of neoliberal transformations. This is what they are not talking about, but something that has become actual reality, reality for so many people. And what is even worse, it is becoming not only you know, on the periphery, but in the very center of what is what we call now former West, something like an actual uh, reality. So when we at the beginning said that there is an idea of, you know, of, of people who are who are participating in power, actually existing power, saying that contemporary art is a, is a leftist hobby. So probably we should, we should intro, reintroduce the notion of fascism. Uh, unfortunately, because it, it, it could be that we will need it in the future even more than today. Thank you. Uh, sorry for ending this discussion with this.